a message on one of the slides so I don't forget. <laughs> That's what I'm a bit like. All right, so welcome to um, one of our first webinars for the, um, for the year, questions to ask before getting married. Now, if you're joining, um, you might just want to quickly mute, mute yourself um, just so uh, we can... It, it's not too much background noise. We heard a few crickets before. Um, but I hope everyone's doing um, okay in this very weird time. Tessa and I were just talking about how it's just such a strange time at the moment. But the good news is it's a Monday night and everyone's home. So that is great. So just a little bit about us before we get started. So for those who are new to Ladies Finance Club, um, my name is Molly. And I started Ladies Finance Club because I personally wasn't very good with money and I didn't know where to go to find the information. Um, I knew it was really important, um, but the books were boring and the men were patronizing. So we started running events, courses and workshops, um, empowering and educating women. More, more webinars than um, events of late, um, but we're very lucky that we can do that. And, you know, for, for many women, money is, um, it can be really challenging because we face, we face unique challenges that, um, you know, are very kind of, yeah, unique to women. We live longer, we earn less, we're more likely um, to retire, we're, more, we're retiring on 47% less super than men, we are more in debt, we invest less into the stock market. Um, so it's really important that we take control of our finances. And so... Tonight, we are talking about um, what you need to know before you tie the knot, or if you have tied the knot, maybe a couple of tips around what you can do. So um, we say, Aussies say, I will love you for richer or for poorer, yet it seems to be the for poorer bit that we're struggling with a little bit. And here at LFC, um, Ladies Finance Club, we don't want you catching any STDs, sexually transmitted debts see what we did there um and actually financial stress is the number one oh, financial stress is the number one cause of relationships breaking down according to relationships australia so it's a pretty important one for those joining we might just get you guys to mute yourselves if you haven't i might just quickly check oh, mute. um awesome all righty so just quickly, can everyone type into the group chat where they are joining from at the moment? Sydney, Betsy's joining from Sydney, great. And if you can't find the chat, um, if you go up the top and push more, GC, Bondi, cool. I'm actually calling in from the Gold Coast tonight as well. Awesome, great, everyone's working those group chats. So really quickly, we've got a couple of rules of Ladies Finance Club. First rule is we do talk about finances. We talk to all the women in our lives about finances, our sisters, our mothers, our best friends, our aunties. Because if you want to be cruising around the Mediterranean um, in your 60s or your 70s or your 80s, you want to have your gal pals there with you. Uh, no more excuses, so no more. I'm just not a numbers person. I'm not very good at finances. My partner looks after it. We're going to be nailing down on that one today. Um, you are the only one responsible for your money. And no question is too blonde. So we have a bunch of questions that you guys have all sent in. Um, amazing questions. Pretty much everyone sent a question. So thank you so much. So we're going to be going through those um, shortly. And just quickly, I thought because, you know, it's all about love tonight and it's all about um, relationships, just um, pop in your, pop in the group chat just quickly. What's your favorite romantic movie? What's your favorite um, chick flick before we get started? Just as some, um, a few more people are joining in. The official cause of death was attributed to a... And here's someone's... Um, Grim COVID news in the background. <laughs> Beauty and the Bees, Notebook, Breakfast at Tiffany's, awesome. So tonight we are super lucky to be having Tessa Kelman with us. 
Now, Tessa is a senior associate at Landon Rogers. She's worked exclusively in family law since 2013. She's recognized as Family Law's rising star in the 2018 and to 2020 20 editions of Doyle's Guide. She was listed as a finalist in the family law category of the Lawyers Weekly 30 Under 30 Awards in 2019. Um, Tessa's interest in and passion for family law extends beyond her role as a family lawyer. She currently drafts head notes for the family law reports published by Net Lexis Nexus. Oh, I'm just getting a bit of feedback and is chair of New South Wales Young Lawyers Committee and the Young Lawyers Representative of New South Wales. I don't think there's a lot about family law you don't know, Tessa. This is a very impressive CV. Um, her in-depth knowledge of the inner workings of the family court gives her a unique insight into the way in which complex disputes are resolved. So snaps for Tessa, <laughs> yay. Um, and we've also got um, our gorgeous Betsy Westcock, um, our head money coach at Ladies Finance Club. She's going to be answering a couple of those money finance relationship um, questions as well. You guys are probably all pretty familiar with Bets, um, but she's our um, kick-ass um, head money coach. And we're going to be hearing a little bit about her later on. Um, so I guess to get started, we might come back to that question. So it's going to be uh, kind of like me asking Tessa questions and I'm going to see if I can make you the main screen here, Tess. Hopefully that works. There we go. Um, so I guess first question, you're dealing with um, couples and relationships and breakdowns every single day. What are some of the most common um, mistakes you see couples make? Um, that's a good question to start with. I suppose one of the biggest one is when a relationship does break down or people think their relationship is maybe on the rocks and they're not quite sure, they might be going through some marriage counselling. Um, I often see that people fail to sort of prepare early. So seek some legal advice, some relationship counselling advice, maybe, you know, attend a webinar like this. Um, and talk to the two of you about what, what you can do to prepare yourself in the event of a breakdown, um, to put yourself in the best place possible if that was to happen. From my perspective, legally, there's certainly quite a few things that you can do to prepare for a separation. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about a number of those things tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but also having your finances in the best place possible and setting yourself up with a structure that if you were to separate, means you're not left in a terrible position, um, which is advice that you ladies often give to people anyway. Mm -hmm. Couples also often fail to act in their children's best interests when they're separating. So if you do have children and a separation is on the cards or is occurring, it's important to remember the impact that it's going to have on your children. People are usually able to be very child focused until something very emotional like a separation occurs. And all of a sudden, the ability to prioritise your children's needs and have some understanding of what the separation is doing to them emotionally falls away. So I often remind parents, let's think about your children. They're the, really the most important thing here and what impact this might have on them later in life. So again, another big mistake, they tend to use children as pawns and part of the process rather than remembering that they're really the number one priority amongst all of this. Um, and lastly, I'd say people sort of lose the ability to be conciliatory and amicable with one another. It's sometimes all about the fight and one person wanting to win. In family law, really, no one ever wins. If both people are equally unhappy, then we've probably arrived at a deal that's about appropriate. So it's good to try and um, not lose track of the fact that we are trying to work through two people's lives and their children and move forward in the most amicable way possible. And so I guess getting straight into it, de facto relationships, um, what defines a de facto relationship? Because I guess a lot of us could probably be in de facto relationships if we're not married and we, we might not even realise. So what is like the, the definition of de facto relationship? So it's a bit of a complex definition. Um, there's a few things to look at. So we look at the Family Law Act, which basically says, in Australia, if two people are together, when do they become in a de facto relationship? And 
to put it simply, there's two elements to this definition. The first is that there needs to be essentially the threshold requirement met, which is, is there a child? Is there a period of two years or more of cohabitation? Has the relationship been registered? Or would one party have made substantial contributions? And basically it would be unfair if the court didn't make some kind of property adjustment. So that's the first step, it's sort of like the gate. You need to open the gate first by saying we've met one of those criteria. And the most commonly known one is the two year, two years of cohabiting. That's mm -hmm. one of the gates that you can open. But if there is a child or you've made big contributions, such as you're building property together and you're putting a lot of money, you may also be able to open the gate. That's not the only step though. Once you're through that gate, the court then looks at whether the two of you were in what's called a genuine domestic relationship. That's the definition um, in the Family Law Act. And that looks at things like the public aspects of your relationship, the sexual nature of your relationship, the duration of the relationship, um, the degree of financial independence or um, dependence, the ownership, use and acquisition of property, the degree of mutual commitment to a shared life, etc. So it's a fairly big um, number of considerations to say, well, sure, you might have been living together two years or you have a child, but does it go beyond that? Were you actually together in a genuine way? And a couple of interesting things is that firstly, obviously we all know it can be between two people of the same sex, but also you can still be in a de facto relationship if you're legally married to someone else. So there's a lot of cases about the mistress, the husband being married to his wife, but also in a de facto relationship, for instance, with mistress. So um, it's a bit of an interesting one, oh but it does apply and certainly can still apply if you are married to someone else. Oh, wow. Okay. So potentially you could be dating someone who's getting divorced and also in a de facto relationship. If, oh, wow. Okay. That gets messy. It gets messy. And sometimes there's, you know, four or five people in the matter with all different interests. So, Good God. Okay. So we've got um, de facto relationships. So when, when it comes to getting married, what does that legally mean? Because we're actually signing like a contract, right? Yes. Yeah, it's basically a contract between two people. Um, the Marriage Act, to get legal about it, Section 4, defines marriage as the union of two people, and it was previously, as you know, of a man and a woman, to the exclusion of all others. So that's what you'll hear read out when you have a marriage celebrant at a wedding ceremony. For family law purposes, a marriage is a contract, but it's also, you no longer have to prove whether or not you're in a de facto relationship to basically be able to have a property settlement or a um, custody issue through the family court. So it basically opens the door to the family court. If you're married, then you're entitled to have a property settlement provided a whole lot of other steps are met. And the court thinks that you do need to have a property settlement different to if you were de facto, you need to prove that you were in fact de facto. Mm -hmm. Being married, you've already met the criteria and you can exercise um, a property settlement through the family court if you want to. Okay, so I guess when we um, start thinking about, you know, we get engaged and we're getting married, we're thinking about the dress, the ring, mm -hmm. um, the location. And we don't generally think about our finances. So I know Americans call them prenups and postnups, but yeah, in Australia, <laughs> we call them financial agreements. So what is a financial agreement? Yeah, good question. And they are sort of known in Australia, I suppose, as prenups because we watch all the American movies yeah. like this. Um, but it's basically an agreement between you and your spouse or your partner, husband, wife, um, they can be done at any time of the relationship. So it can be before you get together, once you're married, after you're married, before you're de facto, once you're de facto. And it's essentially a contract between the two of you as to how you will divide your assets, including your superannuation, your liabilities, all the other things lying around. It could include frequent flyer points, etc. in the event of a separation. So you're basically saying, my partner and I would like to contract out of the jurisdiction of the family court. If we were to separate, the family court's not going to decide how we separate our assets. Instead, we've got our own private agreement. So you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of what you can do in that agreement because it's not necessarily subject to the family court in future. 
Okay. And with, with that, is it, do you find when people are saying, okay, I'm coming into the relationship with maybe property or I've got, um, I've got more assets, maybe I've had an inheritance. And when they sit down with their partner, obviously that's a bit awkward. I mean, because you're, you're kind of like, oh, look, if this fails, I want to make sure I've got my <laughs> stuff. Do you find that people do find it awkward or, you know, is it worth having that chat or can you share any experiences you've, or how yeah, people maybe approach it? It's not the most fun um, subject when it's done so close to a wedding, you know, talking about the dress and then the financial agreement. Um, So I tend to encourage people to sort of think about it as early as possible. Usually a financial agreement is most relevant if you do have, like you were saying, Molly, assets to protect. So if you have... um, properties or a future inheritance coming in or you have you know a lot of money in the bank shares etc then it's more relevant to do one because you do have something to protect if the two of you are you know you get together when you're 20 neither of you have anything in particular of value at that time and you build your wealth together then it's less relevant because as you go along um, the two of you are pretty much contributing equally to the relationship and it'll be probably quite fair what the court would impose anyway in those Mm -hmm. circumstances. So a good example is I had a young girl. She was only in her 20s. She'd been left a huge inheritance from her grandparents. I think it was around a million dollars. And in her grandpa's will was that if she was to marry, she needed to have a financial agreement in place before she could marry to protect that money. So for her, she could say to her husband, look, my my grandpa's given me this money. The condition of me getting the money is that I need a financial agreement in place. So it was less awkward. Um, For other people, the other spouse usually understands if one of you does have a lot of assets as to why you might want to say, you know, let's do an agreement. Sensible family lawyers will usually encourage you to put an agreement in place that isn't unreasonable so it may be that if you are together for a long period of time you you share those assets in some way so there's all different discussions you can have and it's better to have them earlier rather than later and sometimes people just ask me for some advice you know how do I bring it up what's a nice way to talk about it and we talk about a strategy where it's not necessarily something that you're bringing up out of spite or to be difficult it's more when mature adults are in this together especially if you're an independent, financially savvy woman like the ladies here probably are tonight, then, you know, stand up for yourself and say, let's, let's do something sensible. We'll do it together. We'll provide that anything we buy together, we can split, you know, you can do anything like that. So it's a relevant document to have, but don't do it too close to the wedding. Okay. And um, where do you get a financial agreement? Do you have to do that through a lawyer? You do. So because you're contracting out of the jurisdiction of the family court, which is a pretty big deal in Australia, the family court, um, you know, relies on the family court, the family law act, which is the federal act. And you're essentially saying, although we're Australian citizens and this act applies to us, we want to do our own thing. So there's fairly strict requirements for legal advice, which is specified under the Family Law Act, Mm -hmm. which basically say if, if two of you want to contract out of the Family Law Act, then you can prepare a financial agreement. You both need legal advice, so not just one of you. One lawyer will usually draft that document and then we send it to the other party or the other party's lawyer and they need to have a look at the document too. We need to give written as well as oral legal advice. So it's a fairly high threshold in terms of the advice that you Mm -hmm. get and there's some cost involved in doing that. But basically, it's best to think of it as a bit of an insurance policy. Yeah, protecting yourself. Um, Bets, I'm going to throw to you now. So for the ladies um, listening, uh, love love to hear your opinion on where you think you should have the chat. And what chat we're talking here is that money chat. So is it... Is the first date, maybe the first Bumble date's too soon? Bumble date might be a bit soon, but you could decide um, on your first date how you're going to split, like, the cost of the date. So, um, so, you know, money comes up at any point during relationship. And I think um, 
there's no, I guess there's like, you know, any time is appropriate if it makes sense for you. Um, it's always going to be personal to your own situation and your own kind of goals and personality. Um, I think when you, certainly by the time you start cohabitating and sharing bills, sharing expenses, that's absolutely the time where you need to have a conversation if you haven't already. Um, and it doesn't have to be scary or very like, doesn't have to be serious or restrictive. It can be a really fun and inspired conversation. You know, we're moving in together. This is exciting. How are we going to approach how we manage our co expenses? What are we working towards? What are our goals that we want to achieve together? How might we contribute to that? Um, so it can be really fun. It's all about how you sort of perceive the conversation and the kind of energy and mindset you bring to the conversation. So we'd love to hear from everyone. When do you think you should have the chat on that, um, on our very technical scale of when you should have the chat? Do you think it's when you become official, when you're cohabitating, when you're engaged or marriage, um, when you're starting a family? I know um, there was a few um, questions from ladies saying, you know, when is that right time? So it'd be great to um, hit us up on the chat with when you think that right time is. And we won't read out names, so it can be anonymous. Awesome. Thanks, Bets. We'll, we'll come back to you um, in, a, in a second. So, Tess, Tessa, yeah. when it comes to um, how we should split our finances, um, does it make, so say we have um, one bank account, it's all going into that mm -hmm. one bank account, and then we get divorced. Should we, is there a way we can structure our finances so when it comes to the courts, it's easier to find out who's is who or work out who's is who? Um, it certainly helps, obviously, if you've got two separate bank accounts and you can really clearly trace how your finances have been shared in the relationship, how things have been split, how much you've each been paid, etc. I might use this opportunity, Molly, to just quickly talk about how the family court would approach a property settlement because that will provide some context to the answer to this question. Great. So if you were to approach the court, you've separated from your partner, you don't have a financial agreement in place and there's a reason why you need a property settlement. For instance, you might own a property together and have some joint savings in the bank account. You can't agree on how you would split that property. Usually through a family lawyer, we try and negotiate a settlement, but if we really can't, we need to go to the court, then the court basically follows a five-step process. It's the same process that I would follow in practice. So we're all guided as family lawyers by this process. The court essentially looks at, um, is a property settlement necessary? And as I said, if there's joint assets, then it usually is or if one party has far more assets than the other and say the lady's had some children and she hasn't been working, then she's probably going to be entitled to some of the male's assets or vice versa. So the court says, firstly, do we need a property settlement? Secondly, what assets, liabilities and superannuation interests do the two of you have? And we prepare what's called a balance sheet, setting out what all those assets are. Thirdly, the court looks at the contributions that you've each made to the assets. And this is really where your question fits in, Molly. The court looks at your um, non-financial contributions, including homemaker and parenting contributions, as well as your financial contributions. And homemaker and parenting contributions are usually considered fairly equally to financial contributions. Now, looking at your financial contributions, if you can trace back through bank accounts, then it's much easier to say, you know, I contributed about this much each year. But I usually tend to look at just um, employment records or tax returns to say, you know, I earned about 80,000 a year for five years. At that time, my husband earned 70,000. So we're pretty consistent in our contributions, for instance. It's not an accounting exercise and no judge is going to sort of follow a really strict accounting regime to figure out what your contributions were. Mm. But it does help to have that certainty. The court then says, okay, well, if you've each made say it's 50-50 on contributions, they decide they're about equal. The court then says, well, do we need to make any adjustments based on the future that you each are going to have, which is called a future needs adjustment. So the court looks at things like the age of each of you, the state of health, the number of children, um, your income earning capacity and what you're currently earning. And basically says, do we need to make some kind of adjustments? Say it's 50-50, contributions outcome but 
the lady or the male is a stay-at-home parent with young children and is unable to be employed, then they're probably going to receive slightly more of the asset pool if you look at their future needs. So they might get, for instance, an extra 10%, meaning it turns from a 50-50 split into a 60-40 split. So that's the fourth step. And the last step is the court basically says, is this a just and equitable or fair outcome? And that's just looks, taking a step back and saying, is this the right outcome for these two people? So when you look at it like that, you can see the importance of understanding what your financial contributions are. If you don't do a financial agreement and you have a big initial financial contribution, such as lots of money in a bank account or a property, you will get recognition for that. You won't get dollar for dollar. But when you look at the contributions, if you've got a million dollar property and the other party has nothing, then obviously your initial contribution was much larger. Yeah. Okay. And oh, we just had a question come through back on financial agreements. Yes. It's a kind of a funny one. Um, <laughs> they're like, if my partner has way more and I don't have as much, should I bring up financial agreement or should I just kind of go with the flow and hope it doesn't get bought up? Strategically, my lawyer, with my lawyer hat on, I'd say go with the flow. Don't bring okay. it up because it's not in your interest. It would be in your partner's interest to protect their assets. Okay, interesting. And because um, we were talking about bank accounts, bets, we might throw back over to you. We've had quite a few questions around like how should we manage our finances with our partner. I'm just going to pull up this slide that I know you've done in the past. Would you yeah. be able to talk us through this? Um, this slide here because it's a really good one and I think it just um, sets it out really nicely and also thank you everyone for your awesome um, feedback a lot of people are saying it's when you cohabitate I love one um, girl anonymously she goes before this chat I would have said never now I'm saying ASAP <laughs> um, so good to know um, thanks for your contributions lady um, over to you Beth. Okay, so what we have here is our little methodology to managing your money in minutes. And um, we've taken it from the how I personally manage my money in minutes to how we manage our money. And in this, we've got a little P and a little J on the different buckets. The P represents it's an account in your personal name. The J represents an account that could be in joint names. Now, we're a little bit, um, I guess, prudent at the ladies finance club and um, we say that your money that um, that is paid to you your income should come into an account in your personal name the reason being is that if something goes wrong you want to have absolute control over your income and how it's distributed so we always say keep that coming into an account that's in your name and then from there you can distribute distribute it out into other buckets so imagine each bucket is a bank account. We think there's four bank accounts a money savvy lady needs. Um, and they are, the first one is your um, fun money account. So this is your money and this is the one that you get to play with. Um, and we say aim for about 30% of your total income to be spent on fun stuff. So coffee, clothes, eating out, gifts, holidays, that sort of thing. When you're cohabitating, you want to be ben. managing the expenses as a team. So we've got your financial adulting account, which is where your fixed expenses um, come from, as a joint account, and you're working with your partner to manage that one. And then we've got two more, the Future Us and the OMG account. At Ladies Finance Club, we always prioritise filling up our OMG account first. And this is an account with about at least $1,000 ideally three to six months worth of living expenses, the equivalent of. Um, and this is gonna sit in your personal name and it's gonna sit in a fee-free high interest savings account. Now, this account is there to get you out of those, oh my gosh, moments, um, <laughs> which could be, oh my gosh, this relationship's not going how I thought it would, I need to move out or I need to make plans to, to live independently. It can also be for, oh my gosh, I wanna change jobs, oh my gosh, the car broke down, oh my gosh, someone's sick, I need to focus on, on looking after them. So that's your OMG fund. And then you've got the Future Us account, which is your joint savings account with your partner, where you're putting sort of, once you've got your OMG account built up, then you can start putting money towards your future self. And you can do that as a team, we think. Um, so to recap, fund money and OMG money, that's yours in your personal name, financial adulting and Future Us money, you can have those in joint accounts. 
Love that. Thank you so much, Bets, for running through that. Um, I just love how that's structured. It just makes it um, so simple. All right. So, Tess, back over to you. Um, yeah. So, question around... Um, so someone asked us a question around child support and they said, if I'm coming into a relationship and my partner's been married previously and has a child and he still has to pay that child support, um, does that mean that, so I'm just trying to find the question here again. Um, yeah. Does that mean it's going to affect her and her finances? Yeah. So that's a good question. I guess it's sort of, your um, partner's got a liability and you're, you're worried that you have to take on board that particular liability. Yes, I'll just become your responsibility. Sorry, found it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just recap quickly on how the child support works in Australia. So in Australia, if two people separate and they have children, then there's legislation that means basically child support is payable in relation to that child. That includes even if those two people were never together, but a child was conceived, for instance, um, under particular circumstances. And Betsy and I will probably talk a little bit more about that in our IVF and surrogacy webinar. Um, but you can basically go to the child support agency and say we've separated and we've got X number of children and this is our relevant salaries. So the agency looks at what are each of you earning how many children are there? And what's your care percentage for that child? So how many nights per week is that child in your care? And they then use a whole lot of complex formulas that they've calculated in terms of how much does a child cost and how much does an adult need to support themselves. And they spit out a figure that says one parent should pay to the other a particular amount per week. I find with my clients in Sydney that that particular amount doesn't cover the cost of raising a child in Sydney. So often we need to negotiate what's called a binding child support agreement, which is a bit like a financial agreement, but it's in relation to the expenses of the child. So the agency might say, dad needs to pay mum $300 a week. And mum says to me, how on earth is $300 a week going to meet the cost of childcare or private school fees or the violin, dance, trampoline, gymnastics lessons that my children do, et cetera. And that's mm. where we come in to sort of negotiate an agreement that also includes those type of expenses. But by law, you don't have to pay all the extra stuff. You only have to pay what the child support agency tells you. So I've seen men particularly because usually they're higher income earners and have the children less of the time try and say, I'm only going to pay what the assessment tells me too, which just doesn't cover the cost of raising their child. So if you're a female and you have a new partner who's a male and he has a child support liability, the first thing to figure out is, is that liability just a liability through the child support agency, which yes, by law, he is required to pay. And he is required to pay that in his name because he's the adult of that child. You, by virtue of being with him, don't have a liability in your name because you're not a biological parent of the child. So it's his liability. Find out secondly whether there's a binding child support agreement in place because it could be that he needs to pay his $200, $300, $400 dollars a week in addition to half of the NOC school fees, for instance, which is a much bigger liability. So it's good to figure out, well, what are you actually dealing with first? But yes, the liability remains with him, not with you. However, if you were to separate, the court would look at the fact that he's been paying child support, essentially diverting funds out of your marital funds or your relationship funds to his children of another marriage as a factor they take into account in terms of the contributions that you've each made to the relationship. So it's definitely something that's relevant and worthwhile looking into if you do separate. And if you don't and hopefully you remain together, then just figure out what the liability is so you know what you're dealing with and how much money he might be required to pay each week because it will certainly factor into your budgeting and what's in those joint buckets that Betsy just talked about. Okay. And um, de facto, um, someone's brought, um, done a question around yep. is... So with the de facto situation, then you've got marriage. So they said, like, what would be the point of getting married if de facto relationship is pretty much the same thing and you still get, you know, 50-50, oh, it could be around 50-50. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question because that five-step process that I talked about mm -hmm. is applied in exactly the same way if you're whether or not you're de facto or married. So it's the same consideration. If you had the same asset pool with the same contributions, you'd hopefully get the same outcome no matter if you're married or not. Um, and that's great now that same-sex couples can marry as well because it takes that concern out for people. They thought, well, it's not fair if I can't marry and access that same ability through the court, but essentially you can and de facto is so similar anyway. Um, I suppose marriage is more of a personal decision in terms of the party and the excitement and whether that's something that matters to you in your relationship. Mm -hmm. There's a few small differences if you're married, but um, they're not really material. For instance, if you're married, then you have essentially 12 months until you can divorce. And once you're divorced, there's a specific time limit. If you did need to access the family court to assist with your property settlement, you'd only have 12 months after you divorce to access the family court. And after that, you're technically out of time unless there's a special exemption that would apply to you. If you're de facto, it's two years from the date of separation. So if, if you were to divorce straight away within 12 months yeah. and wait another 12 months, it's really the same. Um, but some people might look at that time limit as being slightly different in the two scenarios. But really you have very similar rights under both circumstances. Okay, great. And um, what, there's another quick question here. So, I mean, it, the, the, I guess the, the grim reality is that I think like divorce rates is like at 50% and after coronavirus, I have a feeling it might raise a little bit more. I know they're seeing massive um, applications in Korea and Japan of um, divorce papers go in. Um, so I guess like if we are in a relationship or we're in that de facto or marriage and we are thinking maybe unfortunately the relationship is not working out we can't work through it we want to get out of that relationship what are the, some of the things we need to be thinking about to get prepared for that yeah good question so i'll answer it in um two with two categories in mind and that's firstly your children and secondly your financial circumstances so talking about finances first um betsy touched on this by saying you know make sure that if something was to go wrong or if you separated you did have your own income going into your account so if you've got that all set up and um you know you're financially independent you know where your income goes you know how much money you've got then perfect. If you don't, I would set it up. So make sure that you are accessing your own money, that you're not going to get cut off from joint funds. If you're a lady who's, you know, on maternity leave, where you're looking after children and you're not working and all of your money is in joint funds, then you might think about either moving some into your own name, which can be inflammatory. So it's something to think about carefully whether you do that. But basically making sure you have access to some money in the event that your finances were cut off. Unfortunately, I do often see when the relationship ends um, and potentially the male or the female is very unhappy, they cut the other person off from the joint funds or they take the entirety of the joint funds. So I don't like to sound negative, but it's a good idea to just have a think about that and try and protect yourself. Sometimes you can make the account true to sign, although that often means the funds are frozen and you can't access any of them. Or you might say, I'm going to take out 20000 and then I'm going to freeze the rest just to give me some money to work off because my husband or my wife has money coming in and I don't. Um, have a look at your assets and make sure you're on top of what is in your asset pool. So another common thing that happens is that as soon as you separate, you're cut off from any financial information. Joint bank accounts are closed or you no longer have access to your husband or wife's login details so you've got no idea what's happening with your self-managed super fund or um, your bank accounts or your investment properties so prepare get as many documents as you can get copies of documents in relation to the properties that you own the super that you have any other assets that you have so if you were cut off or unable to go home and procure those documents from the family office or something like that you've got your own copies Mm -hmm. Have a look at your liabilities as well. What's going out of your account? If they're joint liabilities that you're just not going to be able to afford on your own and start thinking about how you set those liabilities up. Obviously, a lot of this happens through the property settlement process, but it's more just at the start, making sure if you were to move out that you can survive for the next little while until you have a property settlement. Um, 
In terms of your children, you'd need to think about, oops, sorry, my dog's making noise over there. Um, you might be able to hear him. Winston. <laughs> Winston. So in terms of children, have a think about the arrangements for your kids. So if you were to move out, who's going to move out of the matrimonial home? Now, this is a really important question. Often the person who moves out of the matrimonial home gets left in a, um, you know, a weakened bargaining position because they're having to find a new rental property. They're not in the, in the home with the children. So if you're the female and you're looking after the children or even the male and you've been the primary carer, then I usually recommend that you do your best to try and stay in the home to provide stability for your children. You're also in a financially stronger negotiating position because say the family home is the biggest asset in the asset pool, you're the person sitting in that property. Um, instead of, for instance, your partner who doesn't have the children is just sitting there to try and stretch you out in terms of a financial settlement. Have a think about your children's passports, birth certificates, important documents. Where are they kept? Do you have a concern that your partner's going to take the children overseas or relocate with the children? If do you so, see that often? I do, unfortunately. Um, oh. I do see, for instance, if, if I'm acting for the mother, she tells the father that she wants to separate. She's going to take the kids to grandma's house for a week. He gets really angry, clears out the house with the passports, the birth certificates, etc., And then it's very difficult to get them back. So if you are the primary carer, I would either take those documents or leave them with a third party who you're comfortable with. Um, and then just have a think about the children's arrangements and how they're going to work when you are separated and what you're going to be saying to the children in terms of your separation. And lastly, it's also good to sort of engage a couples counsellor at that point or a counsellor just for yourself to help you get through that difficult, difficult stage. But certainly getting some legal advice early, even if you're not planning to separate, you can just have sort of a no obligation, half an hour chat with a family lawyer, and just say, this is where I'm at. Can you give me some advice just to set myself up in case it was to happen? Because you'll find you're then probably in a much better position if a separation does occur and obviously best case scenario is that you stay together but worst case scenario is that you're then just a little bit more prepared okay can i just throw in a um question i received on the chat um one of the ladies was wondering um oh, what's the percentage of couples that sign prenups that get married versus um couples oh does actually not even married just couples that sign prenups versus couples that don't like do we know what the percentage of um, I don't know, and it, I don't know that statistic, and I don't know if it could be published without surveying family law firms because there's nowhere that it's registered if you were to sign a financial agreement. So there's no record kept by the government that would say because it's private, it. isn't it? Usually, okay. unless it's gone through the family courts. Yeah, um, I certainly see quite a lot of them in my practice. Um, but yeah, it's, it would be hard to give a percentage. Some lawyers don't draft them because they are risky documents in terms of, you know, you need to do it properly, you need to be up to date with the law. So we're constantly updating our entire firm if there's any changes in the, in the law in terms of legislation or case law. So they're quite tricky, but I, I wouldn't be able to put a percentage on it, unfortunately. Uh, that's just actually while you're there, um, a question that we did come have come through was, um, from one of the ladies she goes uh look um we're both in our my partner and i both in our mid-30s um we're financially independent people uh we're six months into our relationship my partner is resistant to having the money conversation stating it's too early in our relationship so when obviously we spoke a little bit about that but also how can i bring it up with them yeah it is a great question and it, it will um be something that might need a bit of um what do we say nimbleness in when navigating so i always start with what's your money story what messages did you receive around money growing up uh how was money spoken about not spoken about at home um you know what's what are your thoughts your feelings attitudes to money having that understanding of where each other are coming from how each other are wired um, in terms of our um, the way we think and behave around money it will be a really good place to start and i think always come from the mindset of wanting to understand wanting to work together and wanting to be a team 
Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you come with that mindset and you also communicate that that's your intention, I think that just dispels a lot of the walls that often are immediately put up when we um, talk about the money chat. And then I think moving towards um, what are we doing as a couple and, and using that as a bit of a trigger for, for bringing up finances. Because as you start running a home together, you're going to have to talk about some kind of money management. So starting with something small like how are we going to pay our joint expenses together um, is a great place to start and usually one that everyone's pretty pragmatic about. They're like, yeah, joint expenses. Like just like you have to talk to your housemates about joint electricity bills and the internet and who ate my loaf of, you know, artisan bread, <laughs> those sorts of things. So start with that. And then as time progresses, start with your goals as a couple. So often saving towards a joint holiday is um, one of the first forays you'll have into, um, in terms of um, both a joint expense, but a joint goal together. See how that goes, see what you pick up about each other, um, and then move it on to later like, okay, if we are gonna come together as a couple, what does that mean financially? Um, do we, you know, are we going to invest as a couple? Do we keep separate bank accounts? Are we going to join them? Um, and if it's something that you feel like, okay, I am just like not equipped to have this conversation on my own, there is wonderful help out there. You can get help from a financial coach. You can get help from a financial um, relationship, sorry, not financial, a relationship counsellor. And I can't recommend them enough. I know everyone thinks that talking to a relationship counsellor must mean things are going wrong. I see talking to a relationship counsellor as like um, wanting to keep things going right. It's like taking your car in for a service and getting a tune up. Um, might be a hard one to get past the boys, but hopefully, um, hopefully you know, it might work. Give it a go. Let me know how right. it works for you. So those are my tips. Mm -hmm. Start with expenses. Start with a small goal and then talk about how we're going to come together as a team and always come from a place of, I want to understand you. I want us to be the best team we can be. How are we going to conquer things together? I love that because I do know, I remember at um, our Love and Money event we did, um, the relationship counsellor did say one might be a spender and the other might be a saver and that's quite common. Um, that's mm -hmm. quite a common combination they see in relationships. And then they also um, talk about maybe if someone plays the CFO in their relationship, like the chief financial officer. So they'll be, they'll take charge of the bills, but making sure the other is always included in that conversation. Yeah. And that is really important because my, my husband and I, like, I obviously love talking about money. No surprises there. Um, he is a little less interested in it. Um, so we run it that, you know, I am the family CFO um, and I kind of do the day to day stuff, but we always have a date sort of night every kind of quarter. I know Barefoot says monthly, but fucking that happens way too quickly. Sorry, Barefoot. <laughs> so it's sort of quarterly um, where we come together and we always are um, making big decisions together. Um, I'm always keeping him up to date on um, everything that's going on um, and making sure that he has, you know, access to all the information he needs to have access to, to all the money, knows what's going on and is very much part of the decision. He just doesn't like the day-to-day -day stuff, whereas I love the day-to-day -day stuff. So being a finance geek, that's how we do it. So, and that's really common in, amongst a lot of couples as well. And that's perfectly okay. Yeah, and actually, ladies, um, if this is helpful, we've also put together some conversation starters for you. So this is on our website under ladiesfinanceclub.com slash resources. And it's questions to talk, um, some questions you can um, talk to your partner about. We always say, you know, um, leave the house, um, go somewhere neutral. Um, so if it's his house or your house, let's take it somewhere neutral. So it might be a restaurant park. And then we have 18 questions that you can talk to your partner about. Um, so we've got some time for questions now. So if you've got a question for Tessa or Betsy, now would be opportunity. So you can either ask us online or you can ask us on the group chat. Um, while we're um, waiting for that, we just had a, another, um, another quick question actually. And I think this one's an easy one, Tessa. 
Um, the difference between civil partnership and marriage, a, a few people have been asking what's the difference, but is that just terms? Um, a civil partnership used to be popular for same-sex couples. It's essentially registering your, your relationship because they couldn't get married, so they might have had a civil um, ceremony to show their commitment to one another. And at that point, they were basically registering their relationship as being de facto anyway, so they'd have the same rights as a married couple through the family court. Mm -hmm. So a civil partnership is basically a recognition of your relationship, which would mean that when you look at the doors that you need to open to get to the court if you wanted to prove you're in a de facto relationship, you'd more easily meet that threshold if you did that. Okay, awesome. Is there, um, but is there a card you'd recommend to, okay, so we had a question here. Um, I joined late, so I've missed it. Is there a card you'd recommend for shared expenses for couples? And do you recommend credit card or debit card? So we did kind of go over that a little bit, um, Anna. We will um, be sending out the recording of this. Um, so Betsy explained how you can um, us, uh, lay out your finances with your partner and how that works. Um, so you can check that out. Um, Betsy, I don't know if you just want to touch on that question again. Um, yeah, so quick recap is um, the account in which you receive your income, keeping your personal name. Um, the account for your OMG fund, keeping your personal name, but anything for like paying um, joint bills or working towards joint goals can be in a joint account. As far as credit card, debit card goes, um, I mean, debit card means you're spending cash you actually have and you can't get into trouble. So that's always good. But look, credit cards as a tool in and of itself are absolutely fine. As long as you know that you will only spend what um, is within your means. If you um, feel that you might be tempted to spend more than you should, um, to spend beyond your means and not be able to pay it off each month, then um, credit cards might not be a suitable tool for you. So know thyself, decide what's your weapon of choice. Um, and if you're not sure or on the fence, the old Visa debit card's the safe way to go. Awesome, thanks Bets. And um, one for you, Tessa. So um, if you're, I love this. So if you're official, Mm -hmm. but you don't live together nor share finances, does this count as de facto and does it have legal implications? So if I've been dating a guy for two years, but I don't live with him. I've got my finances separate. Is that still considered a de facto relationship? So we'd look at those threshold questions. Um, if your finances were entirely separate and you hadn't made any substantial contributions to each other's property and you weren't living together and there was no child, then you'd be less likely to be de facto. However, the court would look at, were you in a genuine domestic relationship? Um, and if you were in terms of, you know, you um, had the public elements of your relationship, your sexual relations, um, the ownership, use and acquisition of property, here you're saying that you don't share finances at all. So you're going to meet a much lower number of the threshold questions that a court would look at. So it's really on a case by case basis in terms of, well, what does your relationship look like? If a client came in in that situation, I'd go pretty nitty gritty into the details and be asking about, you know, what parties did you go to together? Were you getting invites to weddings as a couple? Um, what were your sexual relations like? Were you with other people? What would your best friends say about your relationship? Did you store a toothbrush at the other person's house? Were there clothes in the cupboard that were yours at the other person's house? So I'd really be getting into the finer details of what did your relationship look like? And it's on a case by case basis. I've got a case at the moment actually where I'm acting for the husband. There's a young child, but they never live together. So the gates open because there's a child. But my client's saying, I was with this woman, but all I wanted was a child, nothing more. She's obviously saying, well, we were de facto and I want a property settlement. And his affidavit there in court, unfortunately, literally talks about, well, what did your house look like? Did you have her things in your cupboard? What was the bathroom like? Were there things on the bedside table that were hers? So I'm really going into detail in terms of the finer elements of the relationship that might meet that threshold or not. It's quite an interesting area of law. Um, but it becomes quite personal. Wow, it sounds super personal. And we've got another one for you, Tessa, and then we might have to um, 
uh, leave it there. So how much does it cost to get a financial agreement drawn up? Yeah. Um, a financial agreement needs both parties to have law representation. How can you have a financial agreement drawn up and then wait a while or months of, before approaching it with your partner? I think she means can you have it drawn up and then yeah. wait a while? So I'll answer the first one. The cost of a financial agreement basically depends on how complex that agreement is. The most complex type of agreement is actually if you're a younger couple who haven't had, ki had kids and you're a potentially childbearing age. So in that circumstance, we'd need to look at a range of variables in your agreement. If you were to have one child, does the agreement change? If you were to have two children, does the agreement change? Does the agreement change if you were together for a longer period of time? So it can become quite complex. The most simple type of agreement is usually the older parties um, who are past their childbearing age. They might be you know, 60 or 50 and just wanting to protect the assets that they've individually built up. But we don't need as many variables in there because they're later in life and they're not looking at children, etc. So the cost varies hugely. In terms of the drafting expense alone, um, you'd be looking at probably $3,000 and up because we've got to draft the document in addition to a written letter of advice, which unfortunately has to be quite detailed to make sure that your agreement complies with the current legal requirements in terms of written advice. So usually I quote sort of $5,000 and above for all of that, including talking to you, getting your instructions, looking at um, what we need to do in the agreement, drafting the agreement, giving the advice, but then your partner also will need to pay some lower fees just to have the agreement looked at from their perspective and the advice given to them. So only one party has to pay the biggest part, which is the drafting fee. Um, you can have it drawn up at any point. So often people will come to me and say, can we work on a document that I'm happy with? And once it's in a form that I'm ready to talk to my partner about, I'll find the right time. You can choose to do it whenever you want. The only um, warning I have is doing it before a big event, such as the birth of a child or a wedding or something like that. If you're really pushing it in terms of time limits, then the agreement might suffer um, in terms of its enforceability in future, if there was a situation of duress, for instance, you know, we're two weeks away from the wedding, you've got to sign this, the other person's feeling pressured. So if there's a big event coming up, you do want to do it as far in advance as you possibly can. Otherwise, timing is really up to the two of you in your relationship and when you feel that the dynamic and the timing is right. Okay, awesome. Oh, we just had one more come through and it's quite an interesting one. So she was saying, if you are in a de facto relationship and you don't have a will, this is a little bit kind of in depth. If you don't have a will, um, would your money, so if you're in a de facto relationship, you don't have a will, would your money go to your family or would it go to the partner? So it would depend if you're, so you are de facto. Um, it would depend if your partner actually commence proceedings to try and extract their share through the family law system. So to do that, you would need to have proceedings on foot before death. So for instance, just to put it into a real life scenario, because it's a little bit hard to understand. If I was in a defecto relationship and my partner was terminally ill, for instance, and I wanted, and I knew that I wasn't catered for in the will of my partner or they didn't have a will, and I wanted to protect my interests because we just separated, then I would go to a lawyer and say, lawyer was me, I would advise myself that you should commence proceedings before the death of your partner because you essentially then get your foot in the door of the family court. If your partner was to die and there's no will in place, you haven't commenced family law proceedings, then their assets would basically go to their estate. And I'm not an a wills and estates lawyer, but as I understand, <clears throat> their assets would go to their estate and it would be dealt with through the wills and estates legislation in terms of how it's divided and whether you could make a challenge on the estate if you weren't catered for in any way. So usually if you have separated and you're worried that a partner is terminally ill, whether you were de facto or married, the advice would be to just get your foot in the door in terms of having proceedings on foot, just to make sure that you can continue because you can continue after someone dies, those family law proceedings to extract your entitlement from a family law perspective from the family court 
which may be a different entitlement to what you would get if you challenged the will or the division of the estate because they look at different criteria. It's a little bit of a complex one, but yeah, hopefully that. No, that's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tessa, for your wonderful, wonderful um, uh, knowledge and sharing it so generously. It's so fascinating. And I think there's so much that we need to be aware of going into um, relationships or if we're starting to go into relationships. Betsy, thank you so much as well for all your fantastic um, contribution then as well. Um, ladies, I would love you just quickly before you go to write the one thing that you, you took away. So what was the one thing that you were like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, wow, I'm going to maybe talk about that. And then I would just really quickly love to tell you a little bit about our six-week boot camp we have coming up on the 15th of April. So this is with um, the gorgeous Betsy, who you just heard from. <laughs> and it's a six week program and it is just going to help you so much with your finances. So the first week we look at money mindset and a lot of this can apply um, to your relationships as well. So we look at your money mindset and explore why you do feel the way you do about your money and how to reframe that and make it work for you and look at what kind of new personality do you have. Week two is all about taking control of your finances. So we're going to show you how to manage your money in minutes, every paycheck, and so how it all just automates. It's awesome. And also the importance of building an emergency fund for moments like, oh my God, there's a global pandemic and I can't work. Um, and week three, uh, financial freedom. So this is all about growing your wealth. Um, and we, this is pretty much where we dig into the basics of investing. Um, and how to get started on the stock market um, might be a good time coming up soon, depending on what happens with the market. Week four is all about super and getting super savvy. So we break down what the hell is super annuation? Why do you need it? Where should you be investing it? How do you know if you're getting charged too much? All that kind of stuff. And there's some great um, comparisons to Jennifer Lopez, which I just love. Um, week five is home and alone. Get what we did there. Punny, punny. <laughs> um, so this is strategies to help you get on the property ladder and also how to pick the best loan for you. It's great. I learned so much in that one with Betsy. Um, I was like, this is brilliant. I'm so glad this is one of the weeks. And then week six is safety net. So how to protect yourself. And in this, we deep dive into financial agreements, um, wills. We look at insurances. So all those things about how to protect yourself, but also your family and your loved ones. Um, so that's that. We also have a bunch of free webinars like this one. So we are, we just love helping as many women as possible. And this is a really strange time and it's really sad as well. People are losing their jobs. People, are, um, their income is dramatically decreasing. So we've got Lisa Simpson, who's an ex financial, um, counselor, and she's kind of like an expert in debt. And she's going to be going, looking at, you know, what are the benefits you're entitled to, um, how, um, who's, who's there to help you, um, ways to stay out of debt, um, ways that you can settle your debt. Um, and also, yeah, deep diving into what are the COVID, um, benefits and also with super, should you be taking that? Um, she, she will be great, um, to chat to if you have any questions on that. We're also doing business finance 101. So, so many businesses were started in the last global financial crisis. Uh, WhatsApp, Pinterest, um, a whole bunch of them, Airbnb. Um, so, if you're thinking about maybe you want to start a business or a side hustle, this one is like the 101 of what you need to know about the business finance. Because if your business doesn't make money, if your idea doesn't make money, it's a charity or you're not going to make any money. And that's kind of not why we go into business. So it's going to be a good one. It's just going to be basic 101. Um, and then we've got starting a family as a same sex couple. And this is happening next Tuesday or Tuesday, the 7th of April with the lovely Tessa and with the lovely Betsy. So you can sign up to all these on our website or um, we have them on Facebook. Oh yeah. And home and alone. So we're just, um, we've got a property expert and mortgage broker and she's going to just be talking about how to get on the property ladder and just answering some Q and A's on that. That should be great. Um, and yes, please stay in touch. Just going to do a quick recap of some people. So this is awesome. So someone had no idea about financial agreements. So they learn about that. Great to understand the definition of de facto. Tessa explained it so clearly. Snaps for you, Tessa. Mm -hmm. um, smiley face. Learned about what financial agreement is and why it's so important. Practical tips. Oh, thank you so much, ladies. This has been 
Um, awesome. We hope you got lots out of it and stay in touch. We have a Facebook group. We have Instagram. We're on all the social channels. So hopefully this won't be the last time we meet. And um, yeah, if you want to come to our boot camp, everything's on our website, www.ladiesfinanceclub.com. Thank you so much. Hey, can I just quickly say, if any of the ladies have any questions and they wanted to have a chat with me over the phone, um, I do offer sort of a 15 to 20 minute chat, no obligation. So if you do have any questions and you need a little bit more advice, then I think my details are on the website. So and are you okay, Tess, if we include your details in the follow-up email to everyone? Yeah, absolutely. I know there's um, probably more questions that people want to ask, so feel free. And thank you everyone so much for your amazing engagement and um, all your energy tonight on a Monday. Hashtag adulting hard. Thanks everyone. All right, bye.